Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. Therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received, with whole humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. The <coughs> Bible, uh, do have it open again, that's Ephesians and chapter 4, that's page 1037, Ephesians 4. <coughs> Earlier this week, that um, our Prime Minister Rishi Sunak hinted at an election later this year. If you follow the news or if you're on social media of any sort, you'll probably have people who are highlighting the American election that will happen later this year. Are you looking forward to it? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Um, yeah, we live in a fractured world, don't we? And in some ways, at the moment, it seems to be getting a bit more fractured. Fighting, disagreement, falling out, people at each other's throats, if not literally, then verbally. We long for peace, and we've just had Christmas. Prince of Peace, peace on earth, <coughs> but we don't see it. At least in lots of places, we don't see it. <coughs> How can there be peace <coughs> when there's deep division? Be it political, nationalistic, personal preference, individualism. I'll be me, you be you, but the two are very different. How can there be peace? In one sense, we have to say there can't be if there's division. But there can be peace amongst deep difference. That's different. There can be peace amongst the difference, but not division. And that's largely what we thought about in the previous chapter of Ephesians, Ephesians uh, chapter 3, but also chapter 2. We've been going through Ephesians last term, uh, from September up until just before Christmas. Uh, we were particularly thinking there about the theme of God's love. God's love. Uh, we're over this year following the, the themes in our membership course, basically, there's three main themes, loving God, loving one another in the church and loving the lost, those who don't know Christ. And last term was loving God. But uh, we don't love God unless we understand how he loves us. We love because he first loved us. And Ephesians 1 to 3 outlines so many of the ways in which uh, God loves us. He loves us by saving us, by making us his. Uh, but as we work through Ephesians 1 to 3, uh, we saw that salvation, what is achieved by the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross in his death and then in his resurrection, what that achieves is not only me being right with God, you being right with God, you being right with God, you being right with God, not only that, but it also brings together people who are otherwise divided. And whilst not taking away all the differences, they are made one in Christ. The point of the Gospel, yes, is to bring you and you and you and me to God in peace with Him. But it's also to bring me and you and you and you and you together to God in peace with one another. And we have been called, this is 19 of chapter 2, if you want to turn back there and following, to no longer be foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints with one another and members of God's household. We are together as his people. And that's what we've seen as we've gone through Ephesians 1 to 3. Um, the great love of God in giving us Christ, who brings us individually to God as we repent and put our faith in him, but also brings us together into his people, his church. And then us individual churches, if you like, there are expressions of that one body of Christ. But now we're moving into chapter 4, 
uh, and in our themes that we're going through, we're moving into loving one another. And now begins a different part of this letter, because up until now it's all about this is what God has done, this is what God has done in his life for you, plural. But now we get on to, here's what you do. Here's what you do. And the great emphasis really is to love one another. But that needs a bit of fleshing out, doesn't it? What does that love look like? Um, and we'll see that introduction to that in verses 1 to 6 of chapter 4 this morning. We'll keep going through a few Ephesians through the rest of the term. We'll probably head to another few different parts of the Bible as well to, to flesh out this theme of loving one another as God's people together. But as we look at these verses, we're just going to take three headings really, and I'll try not to take too long as we go through them. Uh, but first of all, just from first one, <coughs> walk worthy. Walk worthy. Let me read verse 1 of chapter 4 again. Paul writes, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live worthy, or walk worthy, of the calling you have received. Walk worthy, live worthy of the calling you have received. And I remember when I was younger, I, I got a bit confused on this verse and didn't really understand what was being said. I did wonder for a while, does this mean that I, I've got to somehow make myself worthy of God's love? Well, no, it does not mean that. And I thought we sang a song about that, basically, didn't we, earlier? I didn't pick that song for this morning. Uh, but my worth is not in what I own and what I do and, and so on and so forth. But that God has set his love on me. To him I am worth saving, even with all my sin, he wants me. He has saved me. I'm saved by grace. So it's not saying, make yourself worthy of what God has done for you or you'll lose it. That's not it. But it is saying, <coughs> given what we've just seen in chapters 1 to 3, given that you have been recipients of God's grace, you have received his love, this is the appropriate way to live. This is how you live out being one of God's people. It's not what saves you, it's what you do because you were saved. So walk worthy. And it turns out that to walk worthy is not simply about my individual relationship with God. And again, I probably think I thought that when I first came across these verses as a new Christian. This is all about, you know, my, my personal walk with God. I don't want to do down personal walk with God. We need that. Jesus says at times when we go into our room, shut the door and speak to our Father. But the emphasis here, as Paul speaks to us, as God speaks to us, is that to live worthy, to walk worthy, is about our relationship with one another. It's less personal holiness, or that doesn't matter. And by personal, I mean just me and God. But it's never just me and God, is it? It's more corporate holiness that's in view. Our together holiness with one another. A holiness that goes to great lengths, as we'll see here, to maintain the unity of our fellowship's oneness. So, that's first one. What word is going to be all about how we relate to one another? And that matters immensely because the gospel has brought us together as God's people. It matters immensely because it's what glorifies God and we love him, don't we? We want to please him. And this will please him. It matters for our witness to a watching world. Remember, we live in a world that's divided. What a witness when a church isn't. But it's actually a place of love and unity. So secondly, uh, from verse uh, 2 uh, through to verse... Uh, verse 3, verses 2 and 3. Uh, basically, this is love one another. Love one another. Uh, and Paul will use a number of words to, to explain what that love of one another will look like. I'll just read verses 2 and 3 again, then we'll think about them in time. With all humility, this is how we were able to walk and live, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, Bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Let's think about those words humility, gentleness, uh, patience. 
particularly? What's humility? <coughs> what is humility? Uh, well, somebody else has, divide, uh, has um, defined it like this. I think it's helpful. <coughs> humility <coughs> is an inside-out virtue produced by comparing ourselves to the Lord rather than to others. I actually find that very helpful. Uh, we have a habit, don't we, of comparing ourselves to others. So you might look around others in church and think, well, I make so much more than them, I make so much more sacrifice than them, I give my time, they're not giving their time. But that's not humility. It won't produce humility, it will produce pride or bitterness. Rather, we're better to compare ourselves to the Lord Jesus. Because that will give us the right view of ourselves, what is it? We want to be like him, but we'll realise we're not fully there yet, are we? We're not fully there yet. It, it is humble. Of course, as we look to the Lord Jesus, we also see his grace and his mercy on us. So we're not crushed. That's not the point of this. This is not to produce a bunch of people who are crushed by their own failings. Rather, it's to remind us that, okay, I might want to compare myself to others in a good light, but I've got a lot to learn. I've got a lot to grow into. Do. I've got a lot of likeness in Christ that still hasn't been developed yet. Humility. So, we're to walk with all humility. Uh, secondly, we're to walk with gentleness. <coughs> gentleness. Uh, I think that word sometimes, perhaps, can imply to us some kind of, I don't know, weakness? Uh, but it doesn't really. It doesn't really. Gentleness does not imply weakness as in a kind of weakness. Rather, it implies using strength to help the weak in ways that lift them up and don't crush them. That do not overpower or belittle them. It's no coincidence, I think, that often the word gentle is paired with giant. It's not just alliteration. A giant can be gentle. Great power, great strength, but gentle. I suspect during a time when Christianity was perhaps more widespread in our culture, in our country, that's why men who had lives were called gentlemen. It didn't mean that they were wet. They would often be very capable, very strong in the world's eyes perhaps. <coughs> but they were gentle. They, they used what they had to lift up the weak, to care for those who needed that care. Be gentle. <coughs> Very similar as well to, to what Paul says later, we sang earlier, be kind and compassionate. Be kind and compassionate. <coughs> uh, and then there's patience. Patience. It's linked here with bearing with one another in love. You. <laughs> Some people are perhaps more patient than others, but I think patience is, is a difficult one for most of us. Patience. It does imply something, patience, about church life, doesn't it? It implies that, that no fellowship of God's people is without sin, and without weakness. And those are two different things. But in the face of both of them, we do need patience. You've heard this before, but it's been said, if you're looking for the perfect church and you find it, don't join it, don't ruin it. It doesn't exist in reality, does it, this side of the world? Church is always a place that requires patience. Any relationship or set of relationships requires 
patience. It requires bearing with one another in love. That's a bit costly, isn't it? That's a bit costly. I, I don't know about you, but I'll often try to justify any shows of impatience by myself by saying it's the fault of the one who doesn't meet my quite reasonable expectation. My lack of patience isn't my fault. It's perfectly justified by them not living up to what I think they should live up to. Not doing what I think they should do. Not using their time in the way I think they should use their time. And actually, that's all about me, isn't it? The emphasis here is not on people meeting your expectations, <coughs> but on being patient and bearing with the other person's weakness. Patience, and bearing with one another in love. Again, if we're looking for a fellowship with no weakness, we won't find it. We won't find it. It's not going to exist, this side of glory. Naturally, I'm, I'm not even convinced that weakness will be done away with the other side of glory. We'll always be reliant on Christ. We're never self-perpetuating. We'll still draw our life from him. I think in church life, I'm going to dwell on this one a bit longer. I, I think this is one that requires great wisdom. I, I mentioned earlier that you won't find a church without sin, you won't find a church without weakness. The two are different. And sin is, is deliberately breaking God's law. Perhaps not deliberately, we don't even know we've done it, but it's still sin. But sin is, is going against God's commands. Being tired isn't sin. Jesus lay down in a boat and put his head on a pillow and went to sleep. And sometimes our impatience with someone is it actually that they're tired? Not having all the gifts that you have isn't another person's sin, is it? It's weakness. We could keep making a long list. Not having the physical ability to do things at the speed you do them isn't sin, is it? It's weakness. And yet these things could arouse our impatience. And we don't bear with the one who doesn't quite do things the way we do. Doesn't quite meet our expectations of what should be happening. How we need patience, don't we? And bearing with one another in love. And even with sin, sin is, I know it's different to weakness, it is. And sin needs to be confronted. It shouldn't be confronted. It should, it should be patient and gentle and humble with such people. Sin needs to be confronted, yes. But as Peter said to, to Jesus, he thought he was being ever so patient when he said, How many times should I forgive my brother if he sins against me? Seven? Seven, that's a lot, isn't it, Jesus? No, perfect number, seven, wholeness, there we are. And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. In other words, just keep doing it. As long as they say sorry, keep forgiving them. Keep being ready to forgive, even if they've not said sorry yet. No bitterness. <coughs> Be patient. And bear with one another in love. It's, it's beautiful to see that in church life. And it is seeing it. I don't want everybody to go away from here thinking, oh, what a bunch of failures we are. No, what does it work? These things happen. They do. But also there are times when we fail and sin, aren't there? And we're not putting these things into practice as we should. When that happens, well, we seek God's forgiveness. We seek one another's forgiveness if that's necessary as well. <coughs> and we're ready to give that forgiveness. Again, to go to Ephesians 4.32, we, we didn't look at the whole verse earlier when we sang it, but here's what that verse says in its complete form. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. His patience with us is almost unbelievable, but we can believe it, thankfully. 
He is patient, we should be patient as well. It, it's vital to the union of the church, isn't it? The moment we stop showing humility, gentleness and patience, everything falls apart. Because we turn the focus onto me instead of others. On love for them. We're to do all we can, as verse 3 ends, we're to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Are there any strained bonds of peace that you know about when you're involved in church life at the moment? Make every effort then to put that right. Ask the Lord to give you more humility, more gentleness, more patience. If necessary, as Jesus says, go to the one who has sinned against you and talk to them about it and put it right. And that's good advice for home life as well and work life as well. And your neighbourhood. Do those things by God's help. This is what it is to walk worthy of the calling we have received to live us one together as God's people. Let's go on to the next section. Point three. Remember your oneness. <coughs> remember your oneness. Verses four, five and six. Just look how many times the word one is repeated in these verses. Because that's the point. <coughs> okay? We're together as one in Christ. Paul writes, this is why we do all the other things he's just mentioned. There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord. One faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through <coughs> all and in all. Let's just look at each of those things that's described as one there. Now, first of all, starting in verse 4, there is one body. And why should we work so hard for this unity? Seeking God's help by His Spirit, day by day, to, to maintain the unity amongst ourselves, the love for one another. Why should we do that? Because we are one body. There is one body, as described here. There are not lots of different little bodies within the church. I know there are different expressions of it in individual churches, but ultimately there is one church. There is one people of God. And definitely within a church, there shouldn't be little cliques here and there making up different bodies. There is one body. We're all part of one body, that body is Christ's body. Um, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians where there was problems in the church, is Christ divided? It's a rhetorical question to which he expects everybody to answer, no, of course he isn't. He's one. There is one body of Christ and, and we're, we're it. <coughs> part of the bigger church of Christ, but we're a local expression of it. So we're, we're to strive for unity by God's help and love one another. But secondly, there's one spirit. And the spirit has been mentioned a lot. He's been mentioned a lot uh, in Ephesians 1 to 3. If you go right up to chapter 1, uh, and chapter 1 it opens with that fantastic passage explaining all the ways we've been blessed in the Lord Jesus Christ to the glory of God. And in verse 13 of chapter 1, Paul writes, In him, in Christ, you, and it's you plural, it's always you plural when you see that, almost always. In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of possession to the praise of his glory. It's the Spirit who lives in each one of us, but lives in us together as God's people, as a body. In fact, it's the Spirit who first brought us to Jesus, isn't it? And united us uh, to Him. We're called to, to walk by the Spirit in Galatians. Now, do you think the Spirit is going to send us walking lots of different directions? One Spirit? Do you think the one spirit will tell us to, to just walk past or away from one another when it's the same spirit in each of us? Now, it's not the spirit that takes us down the road of inviting if that happens, is it? 
That's our own spirits. That's our own flesh fighting against what God desires. And what I trust as a Christian, we actually truly desire, which is oneness. It's changed our hearts, hasn't it? To walk with the Spirit is to walk with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You can't separate walking with the Spirit from walking with one another. There is one Spirit. Just as you were called, first of all, to one hope at your calling. And one hope looks to the, the future. <coughs> looks to the future. It's the hope of our shared inheritance in Christ. Eternal life together in the new heavens and the new earth. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth, to being in a world where there is no more tears, there is no more sin, where all that has been done away with. But the church is supposed to be a foretaste of that now. God's kingdom has begun to break into this, break into this world already. The kingdom of heaven is present amongst us already, not fully, but in part, and the in part is in the church. <coughs> I've been reading a book on holiness recently, and um, the author makes the point, if you don't want to be with your brothers and sisters in Christ and love them down here, what makes you think you're going to enjoy the new heavens and the new earth? Because you're going to spend eternity with them. He's right, isn't he? Our, our hope is not me and Jesus forever. That's part of our hope. An indispensably wonderful part of my hope. <clears throat> but more accurately, it's us <coughs> and Jesus together forever, isn't it? Us. Not just me. Sometimes as Christians, maybe especially in the West, we do suffer from individualism, don't we? Our culture is obsessed with individualism, with being my best self, with discovering who I am and then living it out, no matter what anybody else may think. In fact, everybody else should agree with me being whoever I want to be. But the Bible is very different. The Bible thinks corporately. We need community. We need one another. Our eternity will be with one another. It will be with sinless one another, so much. We'll make it more straightforward. <laughs> but we're still to work at it now, by the Spirit's help. We're heading to the same place. We're going there together. We'll be there together forever. One hope. One Lord, verse 5. Who is our one Lord? Well, our Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's a wonderful Lord. He's a perfect Lord. A Lord is a one who is over people, isn't it? He's in charge of people. He can command people, <coughs> and he commands us to, to love one another. All his commands ultimately come back to love in some way. He's not going to give commands to be at one another's throats, is he? Our one Lord would not be much of a Lord if he ruled over us in such a way as to cause us to fall out. We're thinking of voting for leaders, aren't we? Don't vote for a leader who brings division. That is not a good leader. We look, I hope, for leaders who promote oneness and love. Not uniformity, that's different. Not everybody exactly the same. But everybody together. And that's our Lord Jesus. He dies to bring peace between us and God and between one another, to break down the dividing wall of hostility. One Lord. One faith, verse 5. One faith. You can take faith there in, in two ways, I suppose. It could be one faith in terms of our faith, who our faith is in. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ for our justification. Our faith is not in ourselves. Not in ourselves to be right with God. Not in ourselves to be made perfect. We, we trust in him to, to bring that about in us more and more over time, but fully when we see him face to face. 
By faith, we, we, we call on him to help us do all of this. He has given us all the same resources to live out this life. Uh, but faith can also refer to kind of the body of truth that is the gospel. We all actually believe the same truths, or should do. You're not picking up a different Bible to me, are you? You might be picking up a slightly different translation, but it says the same thing. We're all, to go back to the kids' talk, we should all be singing from the same hymn sheet. One thing, let's live it out by his help. And then you've got one baptism, which might seem a bit like a curveball thrown in there. Why one baptism? There is one baptism. Well, and again, I think our individualism doesn't help us out here. Uh, typically, uh, the baptism is, is very focused on that one person getting baptised and the fact that they have a new life in Christ, which is great. Never hear me say that that's not true. <laughs> but it's more than that, isn't it? It's more than that. Uh, baptism is not simply an individual thing whereby we give witness to our individual union with the Lord Jesus. It also signifies belonging to the church. That's why churches carry out baptisms, not individuals. I remember when I was a student, there was talk of the Christian Union perhaps carrying out baptisms, and the answer was no. Student Union is in the church. Churches do baptisms. It's part of becoming part of the church. It shows that you're part of the body of Christ. You are one who has been united to Christ, and what baptism symbolizes is dying with him, that's going down into the water, Water is being covered in it anyway, it's death in the Bible. Down into the water with Christ, he died with him. Above the water, raised to new life in Christ. So it's all of us together. This new life is with one another. We are proclaiming in baptism that we, as part of Christ's body, have together <coughs> been buried with him and then raised to new life in him. A life lived for his glory and in love of others. And then the last one, as we close. <coughs> there is one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And just flick back for a moment uh, to chapter, chapter 3. Chapter 3. At the end of chapter 3, Paul prays a fantastic prayer from verse 14. Uh, verse 21. This is what he writes, verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family on heaven and earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his Spirit, and also that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love. <coughs> and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge. Why is he prayed all this about knowing God's love, Christ's love? So that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Have you ever wondered what that phrase means? To be filled with all the fullness of God. If you go back to the um, first few centuries of the church, uh, there were some people that thought in order to be too close to God and filled with God's fullness, what you had to do was almost get away from everybody else. I kind of understand the sentiment in some ways, but it's not right, is it? There was a guy called Simon the Steinway, and he was on top of a huge, it was like a Basically, like a telegraph pole with a platform on top. And he just sat up there all his life away from everybody. And people had to kind of use the pulley system to get food up to him and so on. And there he was on his own. Very holy man. Is that what it is to be filled with the fullness of God? Just go and isolate yourself and everyone, just me and God. And that's not it. That same idea of God being in us that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. But that's what's being talked about in verse 6 of chapter 4, isn't it? One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. 
To be filled with all the fullness of God means to walk worthy in the way being described in these verses, doesn't it? How can you see someone who has been filled with all the fullness of God, or is being filled with all the fullness of God, they love their brothers and sisters in Christ. They know how much the church matters. They know that they need to be humble, gentle, patient, bear with one another in love, and that means being with them. There is one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. I like that above all, through all, in all. Above all, he's the one who's Lord over us. We've thought about that already. We're to follow him. He is through all. How does God's love manifest itself in the world among the Jewish people? Isn't it? He works in and through us by his spirit to be the people described here. Through all and in all, he is in us to do this. Be encouraged at the end here. Because you could come away from these verses just thinking, I can't do this. I'm too weak, I'm too sinful. I, I, I failed at this, and I could feel that too. Isn't it good to know he's in all? All his people. You can call on him to help you. You can look to him, and he will hear you. God is in us. What a thought. What a thought. That's very encouraging. But it also leaves us with no excuse, doesn't it? Look to him. Ask for his help. This is not what makes us worthy in God's sight. But this is what it is to live out what he has done for us. So that he gets all the glory and that we are loved by one another and cherished as he cherishes us. That's perfect. Father God, we confess that in many ways we, we haven't lived up to what is described here. All of us will have failed at numerous points on this in different ways. So Lord, we ask your forgiveness. We thank you, though, that you are a, a gracious and a kind and a loving God. We thank you that he's most wonderfully personified in the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. Thank you for your patience with us as individuals and as a church. And we pray that by your Spirit who is in us, you would help us. Lord, all of us, I'm sure, can see what a, a beautiful thing it is to have a church where there is humility, and where there is gentleness, where there is patience, where there is a bearing with one another in love, where there is great effort put into maintaining the, the bond of peace in the Spirit. Lord, help us to be those people we pray together. Lord, we ask it for our good and for your glory. Amen. <coughs>